Dear friends in Jesus, grace and peace to you. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. A word from our Savior, Luke chapter 20, beginning with the ninth verse. He began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, leased it to some tenant farmers, and went away on a journey for a long time. When it was the right time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect his share of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenant farmers beat the servant and sent him away empty-handed. The man went ahead and sent yet another servant, but they also beat him, treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. He then sent a third. They also wounded him and threw him out. The owner of the vineyard said, what should I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenant farmers saw him, they talked it over with one another. They said, this is the heir, let's kill him, so that the inheritance will be ours. They threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. So what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenant farmers and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, may it never be. But he looked at them and said, then what about this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush the one on whom it falls. That very hour, the chief priests and the experts in the law began began looking for a way to lay hands on him because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. The word of the Lord. Dear friends in Jesus, we've had a few different holidays this month. March the 4th, always sounds right. Pi Day, March 14th. And then of course, a couple weeks ago, the Ides of March. How many of you were putting a knife through your Caesar dressing? That's one of those One of those jokes, oh, the internet was alive and well, I thought, on the Ides of March. Beware the Ides of March, Gaius Julius Caesar. It's when he was put to death, assassinated, stabbed in the back as Shakespeare has so, um, has so, has uh, so poetically, prosaically, I should say, written in that famed Julius Caesar play. But one of my favorite jokes that particular day goes like this. Gaius Julius Caesar, popular Roman leader, author, and philanthropist, died at age 55, surrounded by his friends. And of course that's true, but it's not exactly the whole story. These men were supposed to be his friends. Even Brutus, as Shakespeare wrote, et tu, Brute. Not sure that Caesar actually was able to utter those words, but even you, Brutus, like an adopted son, Caesar had pardoned him and had been a new friend to him, even when he had once been one of his enemies. I'm not here to defend Julius Caesar or anything. I'm just here to hopefully show you that anyone who's ever had a human relationship has the potential for enemies. If I may just get out in front of the whole message tonight and make sure that we don't go away thinking that we're not part and party of this. Anyone who has a station in life, anyone who's been called to a vocation, anyone who has human beings in their life has enemies. Think about the parent who has to sit down and gently but firmly confront the rebellious teenager. You think about the married couple who know exactly how to leave the argument aside when other people are around, but then when they're 
not anywhere within earshot. They know exactly how to take it up again and, and start to carve at each other and, and, and embitter and, and, and battle one another. You think about the supervisor at work who has to deal with the sticky situation, the work drama. The fact of the matter is, human beings, we, we don't have to work too hard to make enemies out of one another. We know how not to put the best construction on the words other people say. In fact, we like to put the worst construction on the things that people say. We practice something called selective hearing. What was that, honey? Or, or maybe even worse, defensive hearing, where we twist the words or just wait for the words to come out of the other person's mouth before we twist it and turn it into our own, our own argument against them. We're sinners. It's what we do. And where there are human relationships between sinners, there is clear potential for enemies. All of this makes us marvel all the more at the steps that our Savior took to his cross. Steps that were human steps, steps not only of true God, but also of true man, not only true man, but also true God. Steps that led to his enemies, including the Jewish leaders, the elders and experts, and including you and me. Now you would think that as the Gospels develop, as you read on, Jesus wouldn't necessarily bring the battle to his enemies. You'd think maybe he'll just kind of keep calm and, and pick his battles, but instead, I'm not saying he didn't pick his battles, but Jesus seems to ramp up the confrontations between himself and those elders and experts in the law. Chapter after chapter, as Matthew's Gospel goes, he didn't hide from the crowds. He didn't shy away from confrontation. Much of what our Savior said targeted the chief priests and experts in the law and the elders, according to the first verse in Luke chapter 20. And then you get to this particular instance in verse 9, where Jesus tells what we call a parable. And I always like to remember, I'm sure I've told you this before, I like to remember the term parable by adding a prefix, comparable. Because when Jesus tells a parable, it's a comparison, it's something comparable to what we know in our earthly lives. We often say an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. You and I don't know what it's like up in heaven and what heavenly meaning there really is unless God informs us. And the only one who's been to heaven, as we heard a few years, a few weeks ago, and I'm sure a few years ago, a few weeks ago in John chapter three is the Son of God. So he came down to say things like this to us, this parable. And this particular one was straight out of everyday life. When Jesus told this parable of these tenant farmers and this landowner who owned the land but who left and went off to a distant place, this was very similar to what the Jews knew and understood, especially near the Sea of Galilee and the Valley of Jezreel. There were some places where foreigners owned land, Gentiles, and then lived in some other place across the Jordan River. And who was left to work them? Who was left with fair or maybe not so fair wages to work those land. It was tenant vineyards, the Jews themselves. So Jesus really puts us into everyday life. And not only that, anyone, but anyone familiar with the Old Testament, like the book of Isaiah, knows that this is a regular picture of God and his people. It's a vineyard. I'll read to you a passage from Isaiah chapter five. Yes, the vineyard of the Lord of armies is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are the planting that was pleasing to him. He expected justice, but instead there was oppression. He expected righteousness, but there was an outcry. He expected good grapes, not bad. And as the book of Isaiah develops by Isaiah chapter 63, the Lord is treading out those sour grapes in his wrath. The Lord's own disobedient, rebellious people. This time, when Jesus tells the parable here in the Gospels, the Lord's people are the vineyard, yes, but the leaders of the people, there's something different. The owner of the vineyard is, is still God, 
God the Father, but the enemies of God, they are these tenant farmers, these vine dressers who are hired, and Jesus builds it into the original language, hired at a fair wage. They really have no reason to be upset about everything. They've agreed to this in the contract. Uh, a certain percentage that was a fair wage specified in this contract. And when the time comes for the vineyard owner to send his servants to give up the profit, give a fair portion back to the owner, what happens? What happens to servant one? They beat him up and send him away. That wasn't in the contract. What about servant number two? Same thing, treat him shamefully and, and send him away. What about the, the third servant? Well, with a, a word that, where we get our, our term trauma from, our word trauma comes from the word for wounded. They wounded him and throw him out. They're beginning to sound like a drug cartel ramping up in, in their particular form of punishment. So what happens next? Verses 13, the owner of the vineyard said, what should I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenant farmers saw him, they talked it over with one another. They said, this is the heir, let's kill him, so that the inheritance will be ours. They threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. So in the parable, these wicked vine dressers, they must have figured, well, the owner may very well be dead, because otherwise, why would this son of the owner come and expect payment. So they, they figured, we're, we're this close, we've already sent out three servants and beat them up, why don't we just kill them? And that was the tragic final mistake. To those who reject the son, there is no life. And um, then Jesus asks his hearers what should happen. They, uh, he will come and just, he says, um, so what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Verse 16, he will come and destroy those tenant farmers and give the vineyard to others. The parable ends pretty quickly. Matthew has it where Jesus calls out to the crowd, what should he do? And they said, he should give those wretches a wretched end. And, and so maybe Jesus told this more than once or maybe... Um, Maybe uh, Luke sort of abbreviates it a little bit, but anyway, the crowd is so riled up, and you can tell that when they say, never, may it never be. It's like an audible gasp in the temple courts where Jesus is telling this to the people. So God's own people were the vineyard. The elders and the experts were the Jewish leaders, the scribes, the chief priests, the councilmen. What about the servants? The servants are, of course, God's prophets. Men like Elijah, whose message was never fully accepted, especially by royalty. Remember, he was in the time of wicked King Ahab and his wife, even worse, Queen Jezebel. Or think of Jeremiah, whose whole ministry was sorrow and suffering for the sake of the name of Christ. What about um, Zephaniah, Zechariah? What about all these other prophets culminating in John the Baptist? who was beheaded for pointing the way to the sun. This is a lot of awful, horrific consequences for God's own servants, only, only to lead to this Assyrian captivity in 722 BC where the northern 10 tribes were carried off never to see, be seen again. Um, God allows the southern two tribes, the the city of Jerusalem to ward off the Assyrians and, and send them away. But then the Babylonians come in 586 and they crush the southern kingdom and carry them off into exile. Only a remnant, only like a piece of torn cloth does God return a few faithful to rebuild, to start a new temple and to continue the line of the King of David, which would eventually lead to, oh yes, the Son of God. We haven't talked about him yet. The son who made sure his steps led to his enemies, even though he knew full well they would reject him and they would kill him. Because I think this is the part that is the most shocking of the whole parable. It's not how wicked 
the tenants were, the tenant farmers, these vine dressers. The most shocking part is that the father sends the son whom he loves. Doesn't that strike you? You think after the first servant, if you're like me, you're starting to think, okay, what are we gonna do to these tenant farmers? Then the second servant, they beat him up and you wouldn't send a third, but the father sends a third and then if he was gonna send family, you'd think he'd send like the nasty stepsister or the funny uncle, but instead he sends the son whom he loves. What kind, what kind of a father is this, this owner of the vineyard? Nothing like us. That part is just so different from an earthly story that it must be a part of the heavenly meaning. And indeed, it is. Because in this whole parable, what you see is God stretching us to see the depths of the wickedness of those who had set themselves up as God's enemies, but also the heights and the wonders of his love. The love of a father who would give up his only begotten son, whom he loves. I can't imagine doing that with my son, but maybe I can fathom it a little bit to know God's love because of who I am. As it turns out, Jesus' final steps didn't just lead to these Jewish leaders as his enemies. Thank goodness, they also led to me. To you and to me, we are included in the enemies. Because with that collective gasp, never, may it never be, Jesus seized the moment. He capitalizes on this parable by quoting Psalm 118, and he says this, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's a famous cornerstone prophecy. Cornerstones back then were a far cry from sort of the placard piece of cement that we, that we put against the wall to say the date when a building was, was put together. The cornerstone was the first stone laid. It was cut just right. It, gave the orientation for north, south, east, and west, and on that cornerstone rested two walls. So if you were to take apart, take out that cornerstone, the whole building would collapse. Jesus compares himself to this cornerstone. Jesus is that cornerstone. Jewish leaders detested Jesus. They wanted him out of the way. Forgiveness for them was something different. It was bought and it was sold. It was something you could purchase, and it was something that you wouldn't treasure or value until the next sin, because then you'd need forgiveness again. But not with Jesus. With Jesus, there was no fake forgiveness. He preached the good news of full and free for nothing forgiveness that costs not even a cent. Instead, it, it costs what Jesus has to give, his love and his lifeblood. Their rejection in these days of the cornerstone would become complete. In the next couple of days, they would have him arrested, and within 24 hours, hour, 24 hours of that, they would have him pinned to the cross. But that didn't end up hurting the cornerstone. Instead, it crushed them. Jesus was quoting a Jewish proverb that sounds a little bit like this back from his day. If a stone falls on a pot, woe to the pot. If the pot falls on the stone, woe to the pot. Either way, it's that lesser material, that pot that shatters. And honestly, Aristotle said something very similar about philosophy. He said, those who philosophize, philosophize. Those who don't philosophize, also philosophize. So whether you philosophize or not, you philosophize. In other words, everyone has to think you might as well do it well by studying people who have loved thought before. And you and I could say the very same thing about theology too. Those who theologize do theology. Those who don't do theology, well, they're also doing a certain kind of theology. Because every one of us has to figure out this thing between us and God, this relationship that's marred by our own sin. It's marred and, and changed by our own actions toward him and toward others. It's very important for us to see that no matter how you set yourself up against this cornerstone, if you do, the result is crushed. 
anyone who falls on it or anyone on whom it falls. And that could be you and me. Because we were once enemies as members of this sinful human race. Paul tells us in Romans chapter eight, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. All the more reason for us to treasure the good news. It's not transactional, it's good. It's not something that costs us something, it's free. It's by faith alone, and it's for even his enemies, all of them. All of us who have gotten into that argument with our spouse, all of us who were rebellious teenagers or are rebellious teenagers or have to sit down and parent and find out that maybe we aren't doing it so well, all of us who are the mediator in some work conflict, all of us with human relationships that, has, that have so much potential to make into enemies, all of us have all of those reasons to treasure this cornerstone, which to us is a priceless gem and a foundation for all that we are and have, because he promises us so much. For those who trust in this Savior, Jesus Christ, for those who have seen what has happened to him, forlorn, lonely, and tossed aside, crucified on the cross, for those of us who see that it's even for us, there's so much waiting in store. There are streets paved with gems. There's, a whole, there's already a whole building that's raised up, a whole temple of living stones on that cornerstone. You and I, just as St. Paul said, who, Lord willing, will die surrounded by friends, but maybe not so much like Julius Caesar. As it turns out, Brutus, Brutus the next year, killed himself because he lost a battle. That was kind of the noble thing to do under ancient Roman morality, which, yeah, that's, that's not so great. God wishes much better for his own enemies. Not death, but life. Not something temporary, but something everlasting. And it comes by faith alone. For you, a living stone built on this rock, once his enemy, now made friends. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand.